Okay, here we go. This is a picture of me in high school. I would love to explain to you why I look so excited to be sitting behind a desk, but we'll just chalk it up to youthful ignorance. As you can see, Travis Lang and I were voted as most likely to succeed from our senior class. Travis Lang went on to study nuclear engineering. He now has a wife, two kids, and a doctorate. I am a high school teacher in South Texas. Thank you. When I was a senior, I was obsessed with being the best at everything. I guess you could say I thought if I checked off all the boxes society said would lead to success, then I would be successful. Play varsity sports, join student council, take piano lessons, be president of the National Honor Society in your senior class, write for the school newspaper, religiously attend youth group, get near perfect grades, near perfect scores, graduate near the top of your class, be homecoming queen. My resume read like a buzzword bingo for college admissions, and college was no different. I was ladder climbing in too many organizations to count and working hard to try to maintain a 4.0 in the honors college. No one could convince me to go to sleep or settle for second best. The recruiters started to come the fall of my senior year of college, and one particular recruiter caught my attention. She argued that at the root of all societal problems was the dire need for students to have access to a quality education. She showed me a two-minute infographic video that kind of culminated with the question, they need great teachers, so what will you do? Dun, dun. And in a classic millennial fashion, that's all it took, a two-minute infographic. So I packed my bag, moved to South Texas, and became a teacher. I'm from a small town, the kind of place where everybody goes to the one football game on Friday night. You can't go anywhere without seeing somebody that you know in my hometown. And too many times to graduate, from, too many times to count since graduating from college, what I've run into mostly is subtle or not so subtle disappointment in what I decided to do with my life. Some of my old teachers, the greeter at St. Louis Church, the ladies who exercise at Regional Park, the Dairy Queen manager, yes, the Dairy Queen manager was disappointed with what I had decided to do. What? You're only a teacher? We all thought you would do so much more than that by now. You know, sometimes I wonder if my classmates would still consider me to be most successful from our graduating class. Who would it be now? The guy who makes six figures, the girl who married her high school sweetheart, built a home across from her parents and now has two beautiful children. Would it be the lawyer, the doctor, the girl who moved to Europe? What about the girl that moved to McAllen, Texas to become just a teacher? I have a sticker on my bathroom mirror at my house that says, you were made on purpose for a purpose. In my classroom, whenever I say, writers write on purpose, my students know to say, I think that what you say and how you say it matters. And as such, I think it's about time we start talking about how we talk about public education. California and Texas educate nearly a quarter of America's children. In this great state, we say we love our teachers, we say we love our kids, and we put our money where our mouth is. K-12 education is the biggest budget line item in this state. We spend about $50 billion a year on K-12 education. Yet if we look at this as the very important investment that it is, what we can conclusively determine is that we are not getting a good return on our investment. Texas ranks 41st in educational attainments. And even more disconcerting perhaps is that less than 7% of our economically disadvantaged students are prepared for college. These are startling statistics. They leave us with questions like why, how. The short answer is, it's complicated. But I think a lot of it boils down to something that can be summed up in a newspaper clipping that my mother sent to me this summer from the San Antonio Express newspaper, and that headline reads, third of Texas teachers leave classroom by sixth year. Some of you might be familiar with this sad statistic. But if not, I'm going to let you in on a little secret today, and that is teaching is really hard. <laughs> and that is not, thank you for starting saying that. <laughs> and that is not to say, and that is not to say that other jobs are not really difficult too, but I'm going to give you just three small examples of a day I had last week to kind of illuminate for you the kind of difficult that teachers face. So 
Uh, day last week, is about 11.45 p.m., I'd been grading for three and a half hours on my couch at home, and I wasn't finished, but I was tired because I'm old. So I went to bed. By 7.15, I was in my classroom. First kid walks in at 7.20. By 7.30, I have a room full of kids that I tutor multiple days of the week for no extra money. First period starts. We are doing a timed writing, so time is of the essence. The power goes out. My students are devastated. I'm just kidding. They're thrilled. They're like, whoa. And I'm like, people used to write by candlelight, keep writing. So they have their phones out, and they're still writing their essays. And I kid you not, three minutes later, fire alarm goes off. You can't make this up. So 2,200 kids on my campus file out to the parking lot. We're out there. We're going to fast forward to my third period. My third period is my planning period. This is time set aside in the day for teachers to work you know, on planning, maybe grading, respond to some emails, um, try to attack the mountain of paperwork facing Texas teachers in 2019. But no. I have a staff meeting to go to, and that's all I'm going to say about that because my boss is here. So, <laughs> so then, well, I'm going to tell you about lunch. I can't not tell you about lunch. I get I don't know how much time you guys have for lunch. I get 30 minutes, which any teacher will tell you means I have 20 minutes on a good day. So on this particular day, I walk to the teacher's lounge. Because of the aforementioned power outage, we have lost 50% of our microwaves, which, ladies and gentlemen, means we have one microwave in the teacher's lounge. So I get in line with my Tupperware with everybody else. And on this day, Bob the sub is here. We'll call him Bob. Nice guy. So Bob brings a fancy Marie Calendar lunch. He puts it into the microwave and puts four minutes. And I'm like, not today, Satan. I'm a woman of patience and peace. Like, it's fine. So I'm with my Tupperware. And four minutes passes. He pulls it out. He stirs. He's smiling. Right? <laughs> Puts it back in the microwave for four more minutes. And I'm like, I can't do this. So I take my cold chili. I go all the way back to my room. And I have seven minutes to eat my cold chili before my next class shows up. These are three of millions of reasons why every year amazing career teachers retire. Good teachers quit because they are overwhelmed and burn out by the seemingly insurmountable odds facing Texas teachers and Texas children. And every year, great teachers quit because we tell them that they should be doing bigger and better things. I have a student, Sam. She's the first person in her family to go to college. She's bright and ambitious. Her major, education. Her family, not happy. You see, they want better for their bright and ambitious daughter. Sam was speaking on a panel this summer to a group of rising seniors at some of our best universities. And when she finished, a boy who was a rising senior at Yale University came up to her and he said, I just want to tell you that I think you're brave. I want to be a teacher. But my parents told me that they didn't spend all this time and money for me to go to Yale so that I could be just a teacher. When I was younger, my aunt, a retired middle school science teacher, took my siblings and I out to dinner. She took us to get shellfish, so, you know, the story is not going to involve. <laughs> and she asked what many relatives tend to ask. She asked us what we wanted to be when we grew up. So when she got to my little brother, total math was super smart kid. He had known for a long time what he wanted to be. And she asked him, she said, Lucas, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, I want to be a high school math teacher and a soccer coach. And I looked at him and I said, why would you do that? You are too smart. You have too much potential. You could be anything you wanted to be. Why would you be just a teacher? My brother never listens to me, so he started college as an education major. <laughs> but within a month, he had switched to business. And I remember asking him at dinner one day, Lucas, why did you change your major? You have wanted to be a teacher for as long as I can remember. And I'll never forget, he looked at me, he's 18 years old. He looks at me and he said, Melina, I will never be able to provide the kind of life for my children that we had if I'm just a teacher. You see, in this country, we say that teaching is a noble profession. But what we say more often, and perhaps mean more deeply, is that teaching is a profession for people who can't find something better to do. Those who can't do teach, after all. You know, I don't know when choosing the classroom became synonymous with, I don't have any personal professional ambition. I don't have any other marketable skill set. I don't want to raise. I'm not ready for leadership. I don't want a bigger say in what I have committed my life to doing. What you say and how you say it matters. 
I don't know how we expect to recruit and keep our best and our brightest in the classroom if we continually tell them that they should be doing bigger and better things. You know, I was expressing these frustrations one time to this guy I was dating who worked in finance. And he said, Melina, teachers are paid what the market values them as. Needless to say, I'm no longer dating this individual. <laughs> But it's not wrong, right? Because what is the market other than a conglomerate of everyday consumers making everyday choices and what we continually choose day in and day out, year after year in this country is to overhype and underpay these noble professions. So, after that, I just really started to think about this, and it drew me to someone, Sir Ken Robinson once said, no school is better than its teachers. So I think it's probably time we start asking ourselves, what are we doing to recruit, to develop, and then keep arguably our most important resource in the classroom, our teachers? You know, some of my favorite teachers existed outside the traditional K-12 through classroom, my student council sponsor, Kathleen Wern, taught me the importance of working hard to face issues in a community that you care about. My college advisor, Dave Salmon, taught me that the best corporations are ones that believe in the inverted pyramid and value people at the bottom the most. My mother taught me everything I know about grammar and to always be kind. And my father, could probably give his own TED Talk, used to tell my siblings and I every day before we left for school, make it a great day or not, the choice is yours and be better today than yesterday. And then he would flash us one of these, because he's a dad. <laughs> I want you to think about your favorite teacher. What makes them great? Great teachers inspire. They facilitate passion and purpose. In some ways, aren't we all teachers? Don't we all have the responsibility of facilitating passion and purpose in the people around us, inspiring people to be the best versions of themselves? Perhaps one of them, oh, yes, that's good stuff, yeah. <laughs> Perhaps one of the most important lessons I ever learned from my all-time favorite teacher, my dad, was that if it is to be, it is up to me. If it is to be, it is up to me. Every day in my classroom when the bell rings, I yell at my students, what are you going to be? And if it's Friday, they yell back, the change, and they run. It's really cheesy, I know. <laughs> but I want my students to see themselves as change agents, not only in their own lives, but in their families, in their communities, in the world. One of my former students who's recently graduated reached out to me recently. She wanted to get coffee, catch up. So we catch up, and she's like, hey, I have something I want to show you. And I was like, okay, cool. I don't think anything of it. And she pulls back her sleeve and shows me this. And so that was not the reaction that I had. I was horrified. I was like, oh, my gosh, is that real? Does your mother know? And I was panicking. Like, in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm going to get fired. Classroom mottos are going to be banished. Children are clearly too impressionable. This is, I mean, it was a good motto, but this is crazy. And I start saying crazy things, and I'm really embarrassed, but I was creating a total scene in this coffee shop, and I was like, haven't you ever heard that Jimmy Buffett song? The one says, tattoos are a permanent reminder of a temporary feeling. You should have thought of this. This is a terrible idea. And she looks at me and she says, I don't want to forget. I don't want to forget you, your class, what you taught us. I don't ever want to forget how important it is to be the change. When I think about the incredibly challenging, intellectually demanding, innovative, and important work I have the privilege of doing with the children of this city. I do not think of it as being just a teacher. In fact, I prefer a definition given to me by one of my students, Maria. On my birthday, she sent me this. You are not a teacher. You are not a worker. You are not a statistic. You are a motivator. You are a friend. You are a believer. 
And most importantly, you are a person for change. Now I want you to think of a child that you care about. What has to change in the world for him or her to succeed? They need great teachers, and not just in the classroom. They will also need greater access to health care, food security, better mental health services, loving and supportive parental figures. They will need bold school leaders, principled politicians, and much, much more. You are not too busy, too capable, or too smart to be just a parent, just a loving spouse, just a volunteer, just an advocate. And you certainly are not too important to be just a teacher. What you say and how you say it matters. What you say, you start to believe, and what you start to believe, you start to become. I am smart. I am hardworking. I could do other things, but I choose to be a teacher because we do not have a broader impact that is watered down. We have a narrow impact that is profound. Yeah. <laughs> I... <laughs> I am not just a teacher. I am a national Hispanic scholar and a small town homecoming queen. I am a 62nd vice president of the Fighting Texas Aggie Memorial Student Center, and I am a 6A secondary district teacher of the year. But more importantly, I am most likely to succeed because I know that when teachers succeed, children succeed. And when children succeed, a nation succeeds. And this is not just about me, and this is not just about teachers. We all have to be motivators, believers, advocates. We have to advocate for things that are important. We have to be people for change. So be careful what you say and be careful how you say it. The future problem solvers are listening. Thank you.